Good afternoon, everyone. We'll start the webinar shortly. We'll just allow a minute or so for people to, to come in. I can see the numbers of participants increasing fast. Okay, well, we'll make a start. So good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this XRB webinar on accounting for leases in the public sector. Uh, absolutely fantastic to have so many people online for this important topic. And um, hopefully everyone's sitting back and relaxing during your lunch hour, you've got something to eat uh, while we uh, work through, yeah, this, this topic that is of high interest. Uh, you'll be aware that accounting for leases lease arrangement has, has subsequently has substantially changed for for-profit entities and you'll be very likely wondering when are those changes going to be coming in for the public sector uh, the when the, the how and the, and the why and many of you will be interested in the the when when should I expect these new standards to come in so in this webinar for the next hour leading up to one o'clock we'll be addressing all those questions uh, the Ipsos B has recently issued some consultation papers on leases, which is bringing in those changes which were seen for for-profit companies coming into the public sector. So the message is that those changes for the public sector are not too far away, and it's going to happen. Um, the accounting for leases is obviously a topic of high interest to everyone. Uh, we've all got different types of leases, either being uh, buildings, photocopiers, vehicles, phone systems, IT equipment, uh, you name it. Generally, we've always got some type of lease arrangement that we need to deal with within our financial statements. The accounting for leases in the public sector has been the same since I was back in school and having the operating lease finance lease distinction hasn't changed the last 30 years, maybe plus. Um, so that the world's about to change for lease accounting. Uh, leases is also an important topic and why it's of high interest to everyone because of the numbers that we're talking about. And when I look at the financial statements of the New Zealand government, there's $10.1 billion of operating leases, lease obligations sitting off balance sheet, sitting in the note disclosure of the New Zealand government, operating leases of $10.1 billion. Uh, so Moving past those opening comments, uh, so this webinar is being recorded and will be available on the XRB website after this presentation, and so will the slides. Uh, they'll be provided, and the slides are useful because there's a number of hyperlinks um, to further information in those slides, so all that information will be made available. Uh, just another piece of important housekeeping before we, we crack on is we um, welcome and encourage questions as we go through the Q&A box uh, that you'll see down at the bottom. Um, so you can type in your questions there and um, time permitting, we'll choose a selection of them at the end and have a bit of discussion about those questions. So very welcome to add those questions as we go. And they'll be monitored if we can ask them immediately, we will or, or we will address them at the end. So the presenters today, I haven't introduced myself yet, Anthony Heffernan, Director of Accounting Standards at the External Reporting Board. Uh, also delighted to welcome Ross Smith uh, to this webinar, who will be presenting on the proposals from the International Public Sector Accounting Standards Board. Ross is the Program and Technical Director at the IPSASB. Uh, today, you'll also be hearing from Jamie Cattell, project manager at the external reporting board who's leading the project in New Zealand uh, together with Vanessa Silly Fisher 
and Jamie will be talking about um, some of the what's going on around concessionary leases, um, very common in the public sector, and also other types of arrangements that kind of look and feel like leases, but they don't quite meet the definition. What is the IPCSB thinking about those types of arrangements that kind of feel like leases, but they're not quite? Um, the IPCSB have also got some thoughts around that and have requested additional information. Um, so I'll start off with um, setting the scene um, before we then move on to explaining exactly what's happening with ED75, an exposure draft that was issued in January from the IPCSB, proposing new lease requirements uh, for lease C and lease uh, Ross will talk about why we're introducing these new standards, why we're introducing change, uh, what that means for the public sector. And then we'll talk about, Jamie will talk about the RFI. And then definitely keeping moving so we can allow time for your questions. Uh, so I'll move to the next slide. So just setting the scene, a brief history. I'll just do one more clip, with Jamie. And changes in lease accounting has been discussed, debated for probably more than 30 years now. And we know in New Zealand, we've got a, a multi-standards framework where we use IFRS-based standards for our for-profit entities. And for anyone working in the IFRS space, looking after a company, you'll know that changes to lease accounting have already come in, have been issued, finalized, and companies are adopting those changes now and have been doing so for the last two years. So to introduce these changes to lease accounting, the ISB, it took them a couple of goes. They issued an exposure draft in 2010, they issued another one, didn't quite get it right in 2013. And then we ended up with a new standard for lease accounting, IFRS 16, which has caused a lot of headline news and has significant impact on the balance sheets and profit and losses of our large companies. IFRS 16 was issued in 2016 and it's been effective for the last couple of years, entities applying it for the first time. So that's already started for our for-profit companies. If we click through what's happening for the public sector, as I've said, the public sector, we've still continued to do what we've done for the last 20, 30 years of accounting for leases based on whether they're an operating lease or a finance lease, what we call a, a risk and rewards model. Um, but the IPSASB are now, um, they've got a, uh, an approach of maintaining alignment with IFRS. So they consider what the ISB is doing and then introduce changes. But the IPSASB doesn't just follow the IFRS, they have to consider what's best for the public sector. Is there anything different we need to do in the public sector? And that's really one of the key questions that you need to think about around these proposals. Is there anything in the public sector that means the IPCSB should do something different than what, what the ISB has done for IFRS 16? Uh, that could be a different approach, that could be different guidance needed, uh, that could be different factors or characteristics that it's just not considered from a for-profit perspective. So what does the IPCSB need to think about when introducing a, an equivalent standard for the public sector. So the IPCSB have issued their first exposure draft, oh sorry, they issued a first exposure draft in 2018 around introducing proposals that were at least based on IFRS 16, bringing in a new model for lease accounting. And Ross will be talking about the feedback they received on that a little bit later. Um, but as a result, they've issued a second exposure draft in January 2001, just recently issued and an RFI, and the RFI, Jamie will talk about, but it's around those concessionary leases where the IPCSB has recognised that they need more information to develop accounting requirements around concessionary leases. So it's a dotted box. Um, so estimating that we expect to have a final pronouncement from the IPCSB um, based on their work plan in, in March 22, 2022, based on IFRS 16. Uh, so that's a bit of, of where we're heading. And I'll talk a little bit later around what that means for New Zealand. The IPCSB may issue, well, are planning to issue a final pronouncement in March 2022. When are we in New Zealand expecting to issue a new PBE standard that will need to be applied by public sector entities? So I will address that question a little bit later. At the moment, we're a bit of the, the high level setting the scene. Uh, so next slide. <clears throat> 
Um, so the current status of the Epstein's B leases project, so I mentioned before that they did issue ED64. This current exposure draft, open for comment, is a second exposure draft. Uh, but ED75, currently open for comment, proposes a lease model that is consistent with IFRS 16 for both leasees and leasors. And we'll spend some time, Ross will spend some time talking about what we mean by that. What, for those that haven't been following what's happening in the for-profit world, um, what does uh, introducing a, a right of use model mean under ED75? Uh, but we'll get, oh, that's open for comment. If so, we will consider carefully the feedback received and then they expect to issue a, a final pronouncement. Um, but that's phase one. And phase two, just clicking through, is an RFI. And what happened with the first exposure draft, ED64, ED64 included proposals for concessionary leases of how to account for them. The APCES B received mixed feedback. So they've taken that away and said, okay, we need to find more information about concessionary leases that exist in practice in the public sector. And also we need some more information about different types of arrangements that look and feel like leases, but they're not quite, don't quite meet the definition of a leases. So they've issued an RFI. It's important to highlight these are two phases. The second phase will not hold up the issuance of a new standard based on IFRS 16, the core model for lease accounting, um, but it'll, it will carry on afterwards. Uh, but maybe I'll just hand across to, to Ross to see if he wants to add any further clarification on that. No, uh, no, not much to clarify there. I did note though already a question in the Q&A on uh, when a new IPSAS uh, based on IFRS 16 would be effective and asking if it would be from 2023. So Anthony, maybe this is a good point for me to clarify um, how that might work uh, from the IPSASB perspective. So Absolutely. If the IPSASB, yeah, if IPSASB is to approve in March, 2022, uh, likely the earliest the effective date would be would be January 1st, 2024. And given the complexity with le leasing accounting, it, it's likely it would be maybe even a year after that. So the IPSASB will consider at the time it finalizes uh, the new standard, uh, what the effective date will be. And usually it's 18 months or more after the approval of the standard that, that it would be come into effect. And it usually, well, it does always come into effect on the 1st of January of the year it becomes effective. So I, I do think it would likely to be 2024 or after that that new standard become effective. Sorry, yep. Anthony, to interrupt you there. No, that's absolutely perfect. Um, so this slide in summary is highlighting that first you can expect a new standard on the core model for lease accounting. And then you may have heard, because it's part of the first exposure draft changes around concessionary leases, that's gonna take some more time that requires some more thinking. So that will come out afterwards, two separate lines of developments. Okay, so next slide, so we're setting the scene and then I'll be handing across to Ross to explain some of the proposals further. Um, and this slide I've sought to summarize in one slide, uh, the current requirements for New Zealand public sector around how we currently account for, for leases. Uh, so we've got the, everything's driven at the moment by whether you've got an operating lease or a finance lease finance leases coming onto your balance sheet discloses a liability and operating leases where it's um, your, your note disclosure and you're expensing those lease payments as you pay them. As the money comes out of the bank account, that's hitting your profit and loss generally. Uh, the box there, a bit of detail, uh, you can have a look at that later when we make the slides available, but just the, the summary of the current state of play in New Zealand, that's been in place for, for quite a while. And again, I remember from university and, and college, the, the debates that you get into around whether a lease is a finance lease or operating lease, uh, that does cause quite a bit of headaches at, at times and quite a lot of criteria to work through. Um, that's all about to change. So we'll, we'll move on to the next slide. And now we're heading into, so uh, the main part of this presentation is on the two documents currently open for comment. That's an ED75 on leases and an RFI. Um, so I'll now hand across to Ross to talk about um, the EPSSB's proposals in ED75 currently open for comment. Yeah, thank you very much, Anthony, for um, <clears throat> setting the scene and for allowing me to join today's webinar.
I'm very happy to be uh, joining you virtually from uh, Toronto, Canada at the moment where the IPSASB is based. Um, I do wish I was there in person. It'd be much uh, more fun to be at an in-person webinar in New Zealand, but uh, happy to be here virtually. Um, setting the scene here on this first slide on ED75, uh, the details are noted on the slide in particular, but there are a few points I would like to highlight. Um, particularly the bottom point, uh, two dates to keep in mind for those who are interested in uh, responding to the proposals. The first one that Anthony uh, will talk about later in more detail, and I believe Jamie might touch on it as well, is the New Zealand ASB uh, closing date of 22nd April. And then the final date, if you're going to respond to IPSASB, um, is to make sure to keep in your calendars is May 17th to send through um, comments on the proposals. Um, a couple things to highlight on ED75 that are important to keep in mind. Um, the big one here, and I'll talk more about ED64 later, so I won't get into the details of the why just now, but um, for lessee accounting, we're, we're proposing a right of use model that's consistent with what was proposed for lessees in ED64 and is broadly consistent with IFRS 16. Um, however, uh, for, for lessor accounting, uh, we're moving away from what was proposed in ED64, where we proposed a right of use model for both lessees and lessors. Um, but in ED75, uh, we're proposing to retain uh, the IFRS 16 accounting here, which is broadly consistent with the current requirements in IPSIS 13 for lessors. Next slide, please. Before jumping into the, the details, it is important to highlight the, the scope of ED75. And the scope's really driven by the definition of a lease, which um, we have up on a slide here. And Jamie, if you could just click through to bring the, the, the boxes up. And there's a number of key points to highlight here on uh, the definition of a lease. And I'm not gonna go through them all in, in specific detail as the slides are available. Um, but it is important to note that the, the notion of a lease here uh, is built off of uh, IFRS 15 and the definition of a contract. So it is really a, a very specific um, definition that drives the scope of the standard. So a lease uh, is a contract or a part of a contract that conveys the right to use an asset, the underlying asset, for a period of time in exchange for consideration. Um, and, and that's quite an important distinction to keep in mind when considering the response to ED75, as well as when considering the request for information that Jamie will talk about in a little bit more detail later. Because what we did find in ED64 is in a lot of the comments highlighted public sector specific transactions that might have elements of a lease or might look and feel like a lease, but don't necessarily satisfy the definition of a lease. Um, and we'll get to the RFI a little bit later and discuss uh, what we're trying to do with that document. But we are trying to keep the scope um, relatively uh, constrained in ED75. But I would also highlight it is largely consistent with the current IPSIS 13 guidance on what would be in scope for a lease. Um, so although the words are slightly different, I don't think um, we're definitely not intending that there's a, a, a significant change in the scope of lease type arrangements that fall into scope of this new proposed standard. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so what's the basis for the change and, and what's the, the key change to focus on here? And, and really the focus needs to be you know, as the lessor accounting is largely consistent with IPSIS 13, the focus really is on the changes that are coming in for lessees. Um, and this kind of comes to the why as well, um, why to change the requirements. And it's really not different from, from the, the private sector discussion and what drives the reason for, for bringing in the change. And it's really moving from the risk and rewards model that Anthony talked about uh, previously, um, um, in IPSIS 13 and, and bringing in this notion of a right of use uh, approach for, for the lessee. And that's really to deal with the problem that was experienced in both the private and the public sector where significant lease transactions uh, when accounted for on the operating lease model uh, were off balance sheet. 
So in bringing in these proposals, it's really about trying to, uh, to move to the right of use model that brings these obligations on balance sheet. Uh, and from a lease accounting or lessee accounting perspective, the way that works is the, the lessee brings on a right of use asset because they control the right to use that underlying asset and recognizes a lease liability for the present obligation to make those future lease payments in accordance with the contract. Um, and it's important to link that to the conceptual reasoning behind that for both the private and the public sector. And that's really because when you look at a, a lease contract, it really is a financing similar to if you borrow to buy a, a specific asset. So that's uh, the conceptual underpinning. Um, and the real impact of bringing in the ED75 proposals will be most lease obligations would be recorded on balance sheet and the operating finance lease distinction uh, will no longer uh, be relevant for lessee accounting. Um, next slide, please. Now this slide really just sets out um, the, the detailed debits and credits related to the, the last slide on how the right of use asset li um, lease liability works um, at recognition of the lease at the inception, as well as the subsequent accounting. I'm not gonna go through the, the debits and credits in details, but I will note that ED75 does have illustrative examples at the back of the standard that help to illustrate uh, key principles uh, related to ED75. So if you're looking for that more detailed explanation of how the principles work and uh, you know down to the debits and credits type details, I highly recommend when you look at ED75 that you take the time to have a look at the, the non-authoritative material and particularly the illustrative examples to get a, a good idea of how uh, the accounting works because um, it is I think it is quite helpful. Next slide, please. So a couple of um, important points that I did want to highlight that ED65 brings in that are, again, consistent with what's uh, required in IFRS 16. Uh, and that's a couple of practical elections that the, the, the ED is proposing, which allows the lessee to not apply the right of use model when it's dealing with short-term leases, which essentially are leases that are less than, than 12 months in term as well as leases with, where the underlying asset is a low value. Now, there's been a lot of debate both in the private sector and uh, we're hearing this already in the public sector about what, what is a, a low value item and you know, how, how we uh, prescribe that. And if you look in IFRS 16 in detail, you'll see in their basis for conclusions, they talked about a figure of 5,000 US dollars. Um, but again, that's uh, non-authoritative and they purposely didn't put in a specific value and we also haven't put a specific value in. And that's for the simple reason that um, you, you know, it's going to be dependent on the terms and conditions of the arrangement itself, as well as the entity and, and what's considered low value in respect of the entity and its transactions. So you, know, you will have to, to make a judgment call on what uh, a low value item would be if you're going to take this exemption. I should note that it is it is a, an exemption, but it's optional. So, um, you know, when you're setting your accounting policies, you don't have to take this election if you don't want to. Um, I actually, my personal view on this is that when you set your accounting policies to reflect the actual accounting for a standard and in making any standard practical, you're probably making these judgment calls anyway when you set your your thresholds for accounting uh, and what's material and not material anyway. But the IFRS, uh, the ISB when setting IFRS 16 thought it was helpful to be a little bit more explicit to give such an exception so that the users of the standard can really uh, think about, you know, what are low value and short term leases um, to give them a little bit of relief from having to bring absolutely everything on balance sheet. Um, I did want to note here that uh, and I'll talk about this more when I get to ED64 and uh, talk about those proposals. But um, we have moved away in ED75 from any specific guidance or consideration of concessionary leases. And that's for the simple reason that I'll talk about more in a few slides. But um, we're really trying to use the request for information or the RFI to gather more information on the concessionary leases issue, as well as other lease type arrangements so that the board can determine after it's agreed the ED75 accounting model in a new standard, how it might deal with those other public sector issues. 
And that really stems from some challenges with ED64. And I'll talk to that more when I get to the ED64 uh, session here of really trying to update the, the lease accounting model and deal with some of these significant public sector challenges at the same time. It, it was quite a challenge for the board when respond, or looking at the ED64 responses to be able to make progress on both issues at the same time. So we've made the practical um, approach of landing ED75 and the updated accounting requirements for leases, and then uh, deliberately deciding to move on to the public sector issues and considering where in the IPSA's guidance uh, those transactions should be dealt with. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a few slides. Next slide, please. Important points to highlight here now that we're, uh, we're moving through the model a little bit uh, is to highlight that ED75 proposals um, for the lessor accounting are largely consistent with what um, IPSAS 13 already requires. They're also consistent with IFRS 16. So uh, in terms of accounting policies and changes to the entity, there shouldn't be uh, substantial changes on the lessor accounting side. And that's quite, a, a, again, quite, quite different than what was proposed in ED64 that I'll, again, I'll touch on later. And there are a few items where there are some uh, minor differences that, that might have uh, an impact on an entity's lessor accounting policies. Um, I won't get into that in great detail now. Uh, it's on the slide here and you can see that in the ED itself. Um, I will note though the impact though of where we're going on ED75 is um, it will re result in a lack of symmetry between the lessee and the lessor accounting uh, for the same arrangement. Um, however, I would highlight that it does allow the IPSASB to deal with the, the real, I would say, public interest problem that was highlighted with lease accounting um, related to lessee, account and lessee accounting and off-balance sheet financing arrangements. And again, I'll touch on that more when we go through um, some of the feedback on ED64. Next slide, please. And I think here I'm going to um, throw it back to Anthony for a quick overview of the process in New Zealand and how things will work um, over the comment period. Yep. Thanks, Ross. So that just gives you, starts to give you an understanding of what this new model will look like. And that leads to the question I usually get when I'm presenting about this is from public sector entities, because you're thinking about your long term plans. When do I expect the, the world of leasing to completely change and for all my leases to come onto the balance sheet? Uh, that's significant, that's major. When do I need to start, how long have I got to start getting myself organized, think about this? Um, so New Zealand um, are PBE standards, which are based on IPSAS and are used by our public sector entities and are not-for-profit entities. And developing PBE standards will generally wait for the IPSAS B to issue a final pronouncement. Uh, so that's the line at the top. But once the IPSAS B issues a final pronouncement, then we'll develop a New Zealand PBE standard based on that IPSAS B final pronouncement. We'll issue that for comment, we'll reflect on the feedback and consider is there any New Zealand specific issues that we need to consider? Uh, do we need, to, that means adding additional guidance to that international standard. Um, so the answer is that um, we'll likely, and this is crystal boiling, issue a final pronouncement in February 2023, uh, complete estimate based on the information we know now. And um, then that could likely have an effective date of from accounting periods commencing 1 January 25, maybe even an extra year. Those decisions have not been made yet or been considered. But that starts to at least give you some kind of idea of when these changes are going to come in, uh, crystal balling from accounting periods commencing 1 January 25. Uh, so, so thank you, Ross. Back to you. Thanks. Uh, now we're going to we're going to go into a little bit of detail on why why a new lease standard uh, for the public sector, and I'll talk a little bit more now about. Um, ED64 and ED75 and the links there and the different models just to give some context for those who've been following the project for a while as well as those who are, are new to the project. And I think the key thing to, to highlight here um, in ED75 
and, and what we've been trying to deal with since the inception of this project in the development of ED64 and now is really the first point on the slide here is IPSIS 13 um, permits uh, off balance sheet financing of lease commitments when they're classified as operating leases. And this really, this really causes a, a distorts the financial picture uh, when assets are leased versus when assets are, are owned or financed through borrowings. Um, because you do get quite uh, unique and different accounting outcomes. Um, and, you know, that really brings us to what the impact we're trying to, to bring with this new standard. And that's really the, the very bottom of the slide here and highlighted in yellow. Um, the proposed leasing accounting requirements, you know, they're expected to lead to increased transparency of public sector lease obligations and resources the lessee has a right to use. This is the same outcome uh, from a private sector perspective as well that should help with comparing um, the public sector balance sheets of entities that either borrow to purchase assets or lease them. So there should be that comparability coming back and an ability to really take into account the, the uh, level of borrowings for that entity. Because in, again, as I said earlier, uh, conceptually from the lessee perspective, um, consistent with where the ISB landed, and, you know, we do see um, lessee accounting as a borrowing transaction to acquire the, the right to uh, use an underlying asset for a, a period of time. Next slide, Jamie. If you could just do one more click and maybe a couple more just to bring the whole graph in, please. So um, this brings us to a little bit of history and on uh, ED64 and what we heard from respondents uh, when we exposed that back in 2018. And it was quite a, a strong response we got from around the world, but there was some um, mixed signals as well as um, some pushback on some of the, the proposals. And ED64, just to give a little bit of overview of, of what was proposed in ED64, actually proposed a right of uh, use model for both lessees and lessors. Um, and from the perspective of the feedback, uh, there was a lot of strong support for the right of use approach from the lessee perspective, and with constituents noting that that really did deal with the problem that I've highlighted on the last couple slides of the off balance sheet financing. But from a lessor perspective, there was a lot of mis mixed feedback, and uh, a lot of respondents highlighted that from their perspective, the accounting wasn't really broken in the same way it was for the lessee accounting on the lessor side of things. Um, and they weren't convinced of the need to move away from the risk and rewards model to the right of use model that we'd proposed in ED64. And then uh, together with that, there was a lot of um, pushback on what the proposals we had in ED64 on dealing with concessionary leases uh, for both the lessee and lessor. Um, and that's really, again, impacted and driven the board's approach to take forward the project. And the board really did step back and, and look at the different options at that time it could have taken to uh, take the project forward. Um, and on balance, what it agreed to take is the approach we're talking about today, where ED75 would, would land the lease accounting model, and that would be consistent with IFRS 16, but that these public sector specific issues and principally concessionary leases um, would be taken forward in a, a future phase of the project once the lease accounting model had been landed. Um, so, and that's a really important point that the board um, had stressed in the debates. And you'll look in the, if you look in the ED75 basis for conclusions, you'll see a full uh, readout of the board discussions and decision process around the ED64 responses and the, the way to take the project forward. Uh, and Jamie's going to talk in a little bit about um, some of the information we're looking to gain through the request for information. Um, but it re they really are, uh, you know, two strands of the same project, but we're just looking at um, taking it forward in a way that we think we'll be able to better manage the two aspects of the project and end up with uh, the guidance that constituents need to deal with these types of transactions. Next slide, please. So moving on to this slide here, it does set out um, visually uh, what was proposed in ED64 that I've described on the previous slide. 
And what I what we're going with with ED75 based on and, and consistent with IFRS 16, which as you can see is a bit of a slimmed down version of what was proposed in ED64. Um, but again, it's important to note that we don't see ED75 as the end of the um, end of the process, but really just settling the model so that we can move on to some of those challenging public sector issues and determining the right way to take them forward based on the information we get back through that. Next slide, please. So with that, uh, we're moving on to the discussion of the request for information on uh, concessionary leases and other arrangements similar to leases. And I'm going to kick off the next slide with a little bit of an overview on what this request for information is, is trying to do and why the board took this approach. And then I'm going to throw it over to Jamie to kind of lead us through uh, the details of the request for information. Um, but first, I do want to highlight that uh, the re this request for information approach is a, is a novel approach for the IPSASB. It's uh, the first time we've taken this approach. Um, and it's really meant to be an earlier step before our normal consultation paper or an exposure draft, um, where we go out with a question or a couple of broad questions. And what we're really looking for here is for public sector entities that have these types of transactions to share the relevant information they have on both the nature of these transactions, um, what the current accounting is for them, and, and how, how these are, why these are important and by providing the details. It's not expected that every entity might have these transactions and want to respond to the request for information. By no means do you have to try and cover every one of the specific arrangements that we touch on in the request for information. Um, but it is really focused on trying to gain better information on what these uh, concessionary leases and other lease-like arrangements are in nature. So the board can really look at the lease accounting requirements, consider if these types of transactions should be covered in the leases standard, or if there is you know, a slightly different transaction that should be dealt with in another IPSAS or in another way. So the board really hasn't um, committed itself to what it will do with this information at this time, because it expects it might learn uh, quite a bit from the responses on this and, and be able to take forward these challenging public sector transactions in a more informed way. So that's really the basis for, for the request for information and why the board has decided to go this approach. Um, so I don't have much more to say on that, Jamie. Um, I think at that point, I'll throw it back over to you. But if, if there's any points uh, you want me to come in on as you go through the RFI, feel free to throw it back over to me. Sounds great. Thank you, Ross. Um, and good morning or good afternoon as it is now, everybody. Uh, I have been given the task of going through the specific things on which information uh, is being sought as part of the request for information. Um, and bearing in mind that this is a request for information, there are no proposals for how these should be dealt with. At this stage, uh, the goal is to gather as much information as possible. Um, the reason that these uh, arrangements or other types of leases have been pulled out is because they don't meet on the face of them um, the standard definition of a lease that is given in ED75. And in order to understand it, I find that it's often easiest to compare back to that if you're looking at each of these and wondering why is this a separate thing. Um, so first, uh, and possibly the easiest to understand are the concessionary leases and the, the leases for zero or nominal consideration. Um, Ross very helpfully went through the definition of a lease earlier, uh, and it is a contract in which a right to control the use of an asset is transferred for a period of time in exchange for consideration. Um, and within that, there are two groupings of rights that are transferred. So you've got the right to extract substantially all the economic benefits or service potential embodied in the asset and the right to direct the use of the asset. Um, you'll note that next to that, I've put, um, I haven't put in, I've put in brackets there, that uh, market value is sort of implied there. And that's really me saying that that is implied. It's not explicitly stated in the ED, um, but I think it is a useful concept to use when looking at um, concessionary leases or leases for zero or nominal 
consideration because what is the difference between a concessionary lease and a standard lease? The most obvious is the amount of consideration that is being transferred. Um, the full rights to use the asset and extract the economic benefits are being transferred for a period of time, uh, but the amount of consideration is often less than the market value of the rights that are being transferred. Um, leases for zero or nominal consideration, often referred to as peppercorn leases, they follow similar reasoning, uh, but with the consideration transferred being either nothing or a nominal amount such as $1, although there are some circumstances in which there are um, limitations on the obligations or rights of one or more parties as part of that. Um, so that, that is why the, those two things have been pulled out separately. Um, I don't know if you wanted to add anything to that, Ross. No? Nothing for me on that one. So next are the access rights and arrangements which allow right of use. These arrangements uh, where you start to get away from things that look like leases but for less money. Um, and if you think of a, an ordinary leasing arrangement involving exchanging the right to control the use of an asset, um, you can think of these arrangements as transferring only a portion of those full rights that are attached to the asset. So in the context of an access rights arrangement, we're talking about transferring only very much that, the right to access an asset for a period of time. Uh, and an example is given in the RFI of this, where a government might pay a private landowner to allow public, uh, the members of the public to pass over their land in order to reach a national park. So the only thing that's being transferred there is that ability to pass over the land. They don't have any of the rights to transform or alter the land or extract other benefits from it. Um, so in that case, it may not look like a lease. And similarly, you get right of use arrangements uh, in that they are transferring only a portion of the rights, um, but rather than access rights, you might be uh, afforded the right to use a property or an asset only for a particular purpose for a period of time in exchange for consideration. So for example, the government might provide a social service that is using a privately owned community hall. Uh, these arrangements may or may not be linked to a specific property. Uh, for example, the, the third party from which you are leasing or renting that uh, may be able to substitute it for another property. So it's difficult to say that the rights to an asset are being transferred when it's actually just something is being provided that happens to be an asset and you're using it for something. Um, and the other thing that uh, has been noted that often would cause this to be difficult to classify as a lease is that these arrangements may or may not be in a written form. So if there's no formal contract, uh, you kind of have not met that contract definition in the ED um, as part of forming a lease. Social housing rental arrangements. Uh, these ones look at a different element of that definition of a lease. So rather than looking at the rights that are being transferred or uh, the amount of consideration, often the question here is around the period of time element of the definition of, of, of a lease. Uh, social housing rental arrangements will often involve transfer of rights to control an asset for an undefined period of time as opposed to a defined period of time. And this may or may not be in exchange for consideration. Uh, and the period can be undefined for a number of reasons. For example, uh, legislation might limit the powers of a, of a public sector entity to terminate a lease arrangement uh, when it comes to social housing uh, or the lease agreements, if there is any, that a tenant sign simply may not specify an end term for that arrangement. And while this does make uh, sense in the context of the objectives of social housing, uh, 
which is to provide housing to people for as long as they need it, uh, it can make it difficult to say that this falls into that concrete definition of a lease. Um, Ross, did you have anything that you would like to add? No, Jamie, I think you've, you've set out the questions quite clearly and, and what we're looking to get back from constituents here. Thanks. Uh, and finally, in terms of specific topics that the IPSSB are looking for information on, uh, is shared properties with or without a lease arrangement in place. Uh, in the public sector, it is relatively common for different government entities to co-locate their activities in a single building. So you might have, in New Zealand, for example, um, you might have a, a building where Ministry of Business uh, shares property with internal affairs or different departments within um, a government organization might share a premises. Uh, while there might be one entity, like a, a head lesser type entity that has a formal leasing arrangement, uh, the sharing arrangements with what you could consider to be sub lessers may be more informal. They may not be written down. Um, they may not involve an exchange of consideration at all. Um, and these ones sort of look as though there's, they could be not leases for a number of different reasons, um, but often it's the informality of these arrangements. Um, and my understanding of this in New Zealand, at least, is that this does occur relatively frequently. So if, if you deal with these types of arrangements, it would be really helpful to comment to the FSB on them. Um, and that is it for, the specific topics that uh, we're looking for information on as part of that RFI. Uh, but there is also a catch-all that you'll notice uh, at the end of it where it just asks for any other information. Uh, so if there is something that hasn't been called out as a specific topic that you think it would be worth addressing, it's really important to also submit that. It's not just these specific topics, um, bearing in mind that the objective of an RFI is to gather as much information about the population of things that you might have to deal with. Uh, anything that you think could be relevant, I'm sure will be very useful and well received. Um, but what is it specifically that the IPSSB would like you to tell them? Well, um, there are two main points and you'll find that this runs through the whole RFI. Uh, first is a description of the nature of the arrangement. How is that arrangement set up? Uh, is it structured as a formal agreement? Are there any limitations or not on the rights of both parties? Does it actually involve an exchange of consideration? Is it at market value or is it less than that? Um, and the other point then is, okay, well, if we know that, how is it that these arrangements are currently accounted for? Uh, for both sides of that arrangement, for the lessee side or for the lessor side? Um, is it currently being reflected in the financial statements? Uh, does it appear only as a note disclosure or is it not actually being reflected at all? Um, and there's no right answer here because it's just what is currently being done. Um, so complete description of as much as you know about that would also be very helpful. Um, and all of these responses that will be considered as part of this phase two of the project will help the IPSSB to decide whether they do need further guidance uh, on these types of arrangements in their leasing standard, whether it might be uh, addressed better in a different space or whether it's something that could be dealt with through non-authoritative guidance or maybe there's just nothing that needs to be done at all. Um, And finally, how can you comment on the ED or the RFI? As has been mentioned earlier, uh, you can submit comments either to the XRB, which uh, you will have to do by the 22nd of April, 2021. And that will go into uh, informing the Accounting Standards Board's views on uh, these topics for their submission to the IPSSB. Uh, or you can comment directly to the IPSSB by the 17th of May, 2021. Uh, and you can do that either through our website or through the IPSSB's website. Um, links 
to both of those will be included in the slides that will come out to you after this. Uh, and keep an eye out because we are also developing a simple online survey that should be coming out shortly uh, that will help make it easier to just give a few points on these topics to us if you would prefer to just do it that way. Uh, and where can you find more information? The full consultation documents, uh, including the ED, the RFI, uh, can be found on both our website and the IPSSB's website. And on the IPSSB's website, you will also find um, the, the webinar where they did an overview of ED75 uh, and an at a glance summary. And I believe our webinar will also be made available on our website after this for you to rewatch uh, when, when you feel like going over the topics again. Uh, and that brings us to questions, I believe. Thank you, Jamie, and thank you, Ross. Um, we've done really well, and we've got about seven questions come through, and I feel like I'm, I'm happy to um, cover them all. Uh, we'll see how we go, how much of them we can answer. Um, but we'll, we'll cover them off, so I'll, I'll read them out, and then we'll, we'll see who wants to answer them. Um, but the first one from Eric, and it's one we expected, is given that finance leases are a form of borrowing, which is specifically prohibited under the Public Finance Act, unless approved through the Minister of Finance, um, what work has been done by Treasury to ensure that government departments don't need to seek approval every time they enter into a finance lease arrangement? Well, if you remember that the proposals that all leases will come onto the balance sheet as a as effectively a borrowing. Um, and also, have there been any work, has there been any work done with Treasury to understand the change in capital operating funding requirements? Um, so my answer to that, and not being a, a Treasury representative, is that I know that Treasury are very aware of both these issues already, um, that there's an active project to consider how these should be managed within the New Zealand public sector. Um, so if they're aware of it, they're working on it, is the answer to that. We've heard that before and Treasury are very aware of it. Uh, moving on to the next question, we've got about five. Um, first one, if you take the low value items for a large entity, say an entity that's got $500 million um, of, of expenditure possibly or assets, could that entity to decide? Could that entity decide to set the threshold um, for a, a small lease arrangement to that would be exempt and exempt to say 20k, or could it be lower in your view to something like 10k? Uh, you remember Ross talking about the ISB has got in their BCs a number of 5k. Um, so what happens when you're a large entity um, to about to apply the exemption? And my answer to that it feels like I'm getting into the area of providing a professional opinion, but my um, personal view is that you're applying materiality and that's going to require judgment about deciding um, what your threshold's going to be. Um, but I see Ross is going to help me out here and he's got his hand up. <laughs> yeah, Anthony, I was just going to say I completely agree. It'll depend on the terms and conditions uh, of the arrangement itself, um, what's material to your entity. And I would just... Um, say if you're a preparer and you're thinking about this, I would say your first call and I would start the discussions with your auditor on this and make sure they're comfortable with your thought process on coming to what's low value and not. Um, my experience um, from my past life on dealing with this type of thing is the earlier you start to have these discussions on your judgment calls with the auditor, the better the outcome is in the end. So um, it's not meant to be a, a bright line or a figure, it's a principle that you need to interpret within the terms and conditions of the arrangement and your entity's financial position, and also with other interested parties um, as what, what really is material and material. So it really is a judgment call. Thanks. Perfect. Uh, next one, which is quite useful, is uh, from Chris. How would you treat a 12-month lease? Um, so does it fall under the short-term exemption when it has, say, five rights of renewal? And um, I'll give this a go first, and then we'll um, see if Ross wants to add any further clarification. And for me, the starting point is important to note 
that uh, the lease term of which you're basing measuring a right of use asset on is not the lease term is not the minimum lease term based on your your contract. Um, you have to you have to consider your all your rights of renewal, and rather than considering the minimum lease term, you consider how long are you expecting to use um, the leased asset for. That introduces a significant amount of judgment, which for-profit entities are currently considering. But it's based on your judgment again of how long you expect as your directors when you enter into that arrangement. You might only have a minimum of a year, but when you entered it, you had full intention of using it for five, six, eight years. Um, so what's your expectation at the start? And also maybe Ross will be able to comment on it. Um, I recall there was quite a work, bit of work done by the ISB, or at least thought put into avoiding people gaming this and just setting up arrangements so they can avoid um, right of, right of, the right of use model by having short-term leases. But maybe Ross, you can recall some of that. Yeah, Anthony, I completely agree with your summation. And, and I do, I think the, the key way to think about it is it's really the substance over form of what's been agreed. So I think it's the nature of what triggers those renewals and whether you know they're put in there to try and game the short term you know, carve out or uh, practical expedient, uh, or if you know, at, at inception, it's, it's really just um, a formality that you're gonna renew, then I would say the substance of your lease arrangement is likely a five-year lease. Um, but as Anthony said, quite rightly, it, it really is related to um, um, what your expected use is of that, that premises that you've leased for the five year or at least for one year on a five with five renewal terms. Thank you. Oh, uh, so I've got about two or three more questions which we'll be able to cover just in time to finish for the end of your lunch hour. So the next one is given off I4S experience, the preparation work to ensure you can reliably report on comparative periods is quite high. Um, so it's saying this, this is hard work when you apply the new lease model for the first time. Um, will a, an extended period from for the standard being, will it, will the, when it's been made effective, will the, will the effective period be extended is the question. And I think we, we heard Ross earlier saying from the IPSAS B perspective, they'll likely consider, nothing's been decided, but they'll likely consider an extension rather than the standard two years, three years. And the ends of ASB, when we issue a PBU standard in New Zealand, we'll have to consider that also very carefully if we want to allow a longer period for entities to get their systems in place and to report leases in a different way. Um, noting that, and I can't remember it, so I can't quote it, but remembering that the ISB al allowed quite a long implementation period. I think it was at least three years, if not longer. Okay, uh, two more. Uh, so A. Ryan is, I'm pretty sure, is Angela Ryan from Treasury in New Zealand. And the question is, did the ISB or IPSAS B ever consider that some of the operating leases under IPSAS 13 were actually contracts for services rather than asset purchases or financing, e.g. leasee was purchasing accommodation services for a five-year period? Um, so I might see if, if Ross wants to give this a, a crack. Yeah, thanks, Anthony. I think um, the key I would I would note here, um, if it was a true contract for services, I don't think you would get all the benefits that you're required under ED75 to have control of the as the, uh, the right of use asset. So that requires that you one control access to that asset and that you receive substantially all the economic benefits of service potential from that asset over the lease period. So I think in a true um, services types arrangement, you probably wouldn't satisfy both of those items. So I do think um, if you look at ED75, it is quite a narrow definition of a lease uh, to keep the scope narrow and it would be trying to get out those service type agreements. Um, and I would say that most of the you know, longer term arrangements I've seen for the use of a premises wouldn't, wouldn't meet a services type arrangement in my, my opinion. I don't know if you wanna add anything to add, Anthony. No, that sounds, that sounds perfect, but it is something we'll keep thinking and considering about, thinking about. Uh, last question, and then we'll, we'll wrap up, um, is from Ken Warren, Ken Warren from New Zealand Treasury again. And I, so his comment is, 
I note the current ED has no provisions or exemptions for concessionary uh, peppercorn leases, but the RFI is seeking information. How is the due process intended to be managed if any provisions or exemptions for concessionary leases are identified? And what would that required, what would, that res, what would be the required consultation or what would that mean for the timetable of the main leasing standard? Um, so on this, this is, feels like a point we've also noted at the ends of the ASB, that when you look at the scope, there isn't a specific scope exclusion in ED 75 for concessionary leases. Let's make another comment, but I'll, I'll leave that for now. But I'll, I'll see if Ross wants to add anything on that. Yeah, well, to, to Ken's comment um, on the RFI and how we're going to deal with that from a due process perspective, I think the board's purposely split the lease accounting model from the RFI question and, and what it might do there for the reason that it wants to update uh, the lease accounting requirements to deal with the lessee accounting issue and that problem with uh, off balance sheet financing. So I think um, anything coming out of the RFI will have to go through its own consultation process and exposure draft and uh, the impact on any existing standards, including a new leasing standard will be set out through that exposure draft. So uh, there'll definitely be another step in due process for the RFI to expose any requirements to the standards coming out of that. Um, uh, at this time, there is no timetable, but I would say uh, it, it's not likely that any proposals will be made until the ED75 based leasing standard is finalized. So it, it'll be a, a year or two uh, down the road at, at a minimum, I would say, but it depends on the information we get back in the RFI really uh, at this point. Yeah. Thank you. And the, the episode's been very consistent and clear that the work on concessionary leases, the outcome of that won't impact the issuance of a new standard, um, a main leases standard. So yeah, that will come come later. Okay, that's all the questions I believe we've received. If I've incidentally missed anyone, my sincere apologies, but I think I have covered everyone. So I'll hand across to Carolyn, Chair of the NZASB, to um, provide some, some closing comments. Just very brief because we are um, over the one hour, but I uh, wanted to thank everyone for attending. We've had a lot of interest in this uh, webinar, which is fantastic. And thank you especially to Ross Smith um, technical director from the ITSASB for taking some of his um, evening out for us here in New Zealand. And Ross, you, you know you're always welcome here. So when, <laughs> when we get some open borders, that would be a wonderful day. And thanks to the staff. Um, the questions and the comments that you've made are really useful to us in our deliberations to ensure that not only are the international standards of a high quality, but more importantly, that the standards we issue in New Zealand are um, fit for purpose and they're useful for us in New Zealand. I think uh, many of you recognise that there's going to be a lot of work when a standard does come through for uh, leases in the public sector. So a very short whakatopi to finish. Te toia, te hamatea, nothing can be achieved without a plan, a workforce and a way of doing things. So please do give us feedback, more feedback and please talk to your colleagues about this and I hope you have a great rest of the afternoon. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks, Carolyn, that's perfect. So we'll, we'll close the webinar there. Thank you for everyone's time. Thank you. Thank you.